This is episode 82 of Changing the Face of Yoga. And my guest today is Stephanie Munaz, who is an accepted expert on yoga for arthritis. And Stephanie has done years of research on all of the different kinds of arthritis that there are and how yoga is beneficial to them. Let's listen. Hello, and welcome to Change the Face of Yoga, teaching toddlers through golden oldies. I'm very excited to be talking to lots of yoga teachers who will explain their passion for teaching yoga to students with different ages, physical fitness levels, wellness levels, and different goals. They will explain the benefits of yoga for these students and will be including teacher tips and pose modifications. I am Stephanie Cunningham of Yoga Lightness, and I've been teaching over 50s for 10 years. So this area is my passion and the passion of many other yoga teachers that you will be listening to in this series. Thank you so much for listening, and let's get started. This is Stephanie Cunningham, and this is the latest episode of Changing the Face of Yoga. I have a great guest today. It's Stephanie Munas, who is a very respected researcher in the field of uh, arthritis and yoga. She was with John Hopkins for eight years and directed and designed a study to see how yoga could help people with osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. She has now moved to the University of Maryland, where she is the Director of Clinical and Academic Research at Maryland University's Integrative Health area. She's a yoga therapist. She has a PhD, a CMA, an MFA. Uh, She's a certified yoga therapist and an experienced yoga teacher. So we welcome Stephanie. And Stephanie, is there anything else you'd like to add to that particular introduction? Thank you so much, Stephanie, for the introduction and for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll make one correction, just that I am at the Maryland University of Integrative Health, which is different from the University of Maryland, although we are close collaborators with them. Ah, okay, great. Good to know. (laughs) So why did you decide to generate your research around the arthritic uh, conditions that are quite common. I I teach older people, so I know how how common they are, but why was that of interest to you? So the short answer is that it's my dharma and your dharma finds you. (laughs) Um, And so I never sought out to be the expert in this particular field. When I was very small, as you mentioned, I have a, an MFA and a CMA, and those are both degrees in the world of movement and dance. And I had a mother who was a dance teacher, and I started dancing at three years old. And I remember as a child that whatever was going on in my life, you know, in the daily dramas of childhood and adolescence, anything that was of concern to me when I walked into the yoga studio disappeared in the process of dance. And I remember having a kind of epiphany on a particularly crummy day that was not so crummy once I got into the dance studio, that this was a strategy for the alleviation of suffering. And that my suffering was very minor in contrast to the suffering of many people in the world. And yet most people didn't have this tool that I somehow had been given. And at that time, which was sort of in middle childhood, I decided that it was going to be a mission of mine to help people understand how they could find this state for themselves and suffer less. And so I went into originally neuroscience because I figured whatever that was that was transformational for me was happening in my brain. And then ended up in public health, where I really think transformation of the masses occurs. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful to have found public health. But in retrospect, what I realize I have done is exactly what I set out to do as a child through a very circuitous path. But I help people to find a mind-body connection to be 
fully engaged in the present moment through the experience of what's happening in their bodies and thereby alleviate suffering of many kinds. And the story of how I ended up doing it in arthritis is really a lot of serendipities and doors that opened and I walked through. But I think that while I happen to now be expert in this particular population, what is central to me is that I'm using mind-body practices to help alleviate suffering for people who suffer. And it happens that arthritis is the leading cause of disability in the States and elsewhere. And so understanding how to alleviate suffering for that community goes a long way in helping to alleviate suffering in general. Okay, great explanation. When you talk about mind-body connection, I've had people on who have talked about that. And would you define that for us? Because I've noticed that people have slightly different definitions. (laughs) And so it's hard to start from the same place. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So from the scientific perspective, What I'm talking about are mind-body practices as defined by the the branch of the National Institutes of Health where yoga fits, and that is the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And so there are many different types of mind-body practices. There are behavioral interventions there, as opposed to some therapies where a treatment is being provided to you or done on you, Um, something that is passively received like massage or acupuncture. A mind-body practice is something that you do yourself. And this is why I think that it fits nicely into public health because these are strategies for self-care. They're ways that we take care of ourselves. And when someone is leading yoga therapy or teaching a yoga class, they're really facilitating that process of self-care. It's also why it's kind of hard for people to start a practice and stick with it because it requires engagement and commitment to the practice as opposed to what is often seen in our society as a way of managing health, which is I'm just going to show up and you're going to do something to me or give me something that's Mm. easy. This is changing the way that we live by using tools that we have to practice ourselves. And it's called a mind-body practice because it is simultaneously engaging both the mind and the body and thereby integrating the two. And so when we talk about yoga as union from the original definition of the word, it is finding that connection between the mind and the body through that practice. Very nice. I like that one. (laughs) I'd like to kind of segue into the research uh, things that you're doing. And I, I thought you did a very excellent job of explaining why we need uh, research in yoga, whereas that clinical evidence versus personal perception. Could you expand a bit on that? Because I think that's hard for some people to really understand because I think yoga is to an extent rather based on personal perception. Yeah. So I I think what you're getting at is that many people have the, the idea that we don't need yoga research because anecdotally we know that yoga works because we experience it ourselves in our own lives and through the changes that we observe in our students and clients and therefore research evidence is sort of unnecessary. And there are a variety of reasons why we need research. One is that our own personal experience is biased. It's subjective and it's informed by what we expect, what we have experienced in the past, what we believe to be true. Uh, And there's lots of science behind this that we tend to notice things that are reinforcing of the ideas that we already have. And what research aims to do, and there are many, many different research strategies that have different strengths and weaknesses, but much of research aims to either reduce that bias or balance out that bias and look at the data for what it is with equanimity. 
And this is something that actually is very much aligned with yoga philosophy in being, in understanding the difference between our subjective experience and objective reality. And that we need both. We, we need, our decisions should be informed by both. And the, the three arms of evidence-informed practice, in other words, when we take evidence and we use it in our decision-making, whether that's the decisions we make about how to practice yoga ourselves or the decisions we make with our students and clients, those should be informed by three things. Expert opinion, which is our training and what our mentors say and what has been written by the sages over the years. Um, clinical preference, so that's what the student or patient or client wants and needs, what their priorities are, and then what the collective body of generalizable evidence says. So if you're missing the evidence, then you're missing an arm. Uh, and that arm happens to be what's viewed most strongly by a lot of policymakers. And so if we want to change not only the way that our own choices are informed, but also the way that decisions get made on a policy level from local to international, then we need the objective evidence to be able to back up our own personal experience. Okay. So... I have a PhD, so I have been trained in how to look at research and uh, analyze whether I think it's something that I want to add. But I am concerned about, there's a lot of yoga research out there. Mm -hmm. There's some that's not very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how is a, a yoga teacher who has not been trained in the uh, structure, shall we say, of research to know if they're looking at good research. So I'm, I'm really yeah. wondering if all of this research isn't kind of counterproductive in some way. That's a great question, Stephanie. <laughs> okay, so one thing is you have to understand where we are in the trajectory of yoga research. So yoga research conducted in the ways that modern health research happens is relatively new. It's not that experiments weren't done a long time ago, but the way that they were conducted and the way that they were documented is not aligned with modern understanding of research rigor. It's only in the last few decades that evidence has really started to gather, and that's for a few reasons, one of which there wasn't any funding for it. And so mm -hmm. yoga research was happening because somebody had a passion project on the side without any money because they cared about it and wanted to do it despite. And so the early studies tend to be really little pilot studies with just a pre and a post you know, very small sample size, not very rigorous data collection because they didn't have the funds to be able to have an appropriate staff with a team with the right expertise and the right outcome measures and the right study design, et cetera. And now that funding does exist. And it's because much of those early studies, as poorly as they may have been done, were really promising. And, you know, maybe for yoga more than, than some other aspects of what was at that time called complementary and alternative medicine. And so funding is now available for more rigorous studies. And what has happened is a gradual movement from uh, what we might call feasibility studies, right? Small studies to say, oh, people are willing to do yoga. Remember that when yoga research kind of started, it was a little bizarre uh, mm -hmm. to the Western sentiments. And there was question about whether people would actually even do this. And the other questions were about safety, especially in my population, which is arthritis. Even when I started at Johns Hopkins in the early 2000s, many of the rheumatologists were reluctant to refer their patients to me because they were concerned about patient safety. So very little understanding about safety. And so early evidence was just necessary to say, people are willing to do it. It's relatively safe. People aren't getting hurt. So not having adverse events was really important. And now we're starting to see an era with more rigorous study designs and non-inferiority studies comparing yoga to other accepted modalities, starting to get into questions of, well, how much yoga do you need? Does the dose matter? Does the style matter? Uh, if it's 
physically vigorous versus if it's more meditative. These are the kinds of questions that can now start to be asked because we've already been able to demonstrate that it's safe and feasible. Unfortunately, research, as you know, moves really slowly. <laughs> and so what seems like it should be a no-brainer takes a very long time to bear out in the evidence. And I kind of like to say that a research study is like one piece of a jigsaw puzzle. So if you mouse doing like a thousand piece puzzle, you do a study that maybe takes five years and all you're contributing is a tiny little piece to the puzzle. And it takes a whole lot of different pieces and each one has its own strengths and weaknesses and its own little piece that it contributes to the greater understanding. And it's only once you get enough of those pieces in place that you start to see what the general picture looks like. I like that does explain it well, but what... What would you say to a yoga teacher who does not have a background in research about what she or he should be looking for if they want to add or subtract or whatever to their maybe personal yoga practice, but specifically for their students and, and or their clients? Right. You know, I think that really it's a somewhat of a failing of education in general, that we don't have a science literate or research literate populace. I think that this is something that everyone should be learning in high school because research informs so many of the decisions that we need to make on a daily basis. And without being able to understand the science, we're at the mercy of whoever is translating it into general language for us from decisions like mm -hmm. whether or not to use butter or margarine or <laughs> coconut oil or whatever, right? There are a whole bunch of decisions that we make every day that can and should be informed by science. And this is just one of those, especially at least on the level of professional education. It's a disservice to health professionals to not have training in how to understand the research that we should all be up on that really is true of pretty much every health profession in the modern world. So I think that it's a failing that yoga professionals are not learning how to consume this literature. That being said, it's not easy and trainings are short and it's hard to fit that in. And so it's sort of left to us to become as literate as possible. One thing I would say is to find sources of information that you can trust. And because every individual study is just like a little puzzle piece, relying more on summary research, so systematic reviews and meta-analyses where a professional expert has done the work of collecting all the information to date and talking about it as a whole, making recommendations about how this might apply, what the strength of the evidence is and how it might apply clinically, looking for policy briefs and white papers that talk about the research in general and the state of the research. And NCCIH, the, the branch of NIH that I was talking about earlier, is a good source of information. You have to understand that NIH and other similar bodies are very conservative in the conclusions that they will make about evidence. And it's also important to know that a lack of evidence is not evidence of lack. So sometimes there will be a statement made that the evidence is weak to support yoga for irritable bowel syndrome or whatever it is. And it doesn't mean that there is evidence saying it doesn't work. It says that the evidence isn't strong enough to make solid recommendations. And usually that's just because the evidence hasn't sufficiently accumulated. There aren't enough puzzle pieces in the picture. Uh, I, I wrote an article recently that hasn't been published yet for Yoga International that provides some strategies for how yoga professionals can become more research literate and you become more literate at anything by reading. Mm -hmm. And so not being afraid to give it a try and look through some papers and read the International Journal for Yoga Therapists and look up the concepts that you don't understand and talk about it with people you know. Uh, there's a textbook, Principles and Practices of Yoga in Healthcare, where I contributed a chapter with a couple of co-authors. And the chapters are all written by researchers in those fields, but they're written for yoga professionals and healthcare providers to make some sense of the body of literature that's out there. We're going to have to update that because every few years it's already out of date because research is always accumulating. Yeah. But that's, 
that kind of thing where, where a scientific expert is compiling the evidence for you is a good place to start. Okay, excellent. So now we're going to segue just slightly because what you're doing right now is you're developing some guidelines for clinical practice. So let's talk a little bit about that and how that may or may not be different from, from the yoga teacher in the class. Okay, what, what I think you might be talking about, Stephanie, is the research reporting guidelines that I'm yes. working to develop. Okay, so those are not clinical guidelines. So let me just explain the, the difference. I'm working on a few different projects right now, and that one I'm really excited about, and it actually dovetails from what we were just talking about quite nicely. When you say that a lot of the yoga research is poor, Mm-hmm. One of the things that's poor about it is how the research was actually conducted, right? That it, it's yeah. not very rigorous. It's mm-hmm. not randomized. There isn't an adequate control group. The sample sizes are poor. The measures aren't validated, et cetera. But another big problem in the yoga literature is that it's poorly reported. So oftentimes I'll be reading a yoga manuscript or a research paper, and it'll say yoga was practiced one hour twice a week for eight weeks. And that's like the end of the description (laughs) of the yoga. And so, you know, if you're talking about how do we use the research to make clinical decisions, how do we use the research to make decisions about what we're going to offer to our students and clients? Well, if somebody was successful in that study, if it actually resulted in positive outcomes like decreasing pain, for example, we have no idea what they did. And so we have no idea what to recommend. And so what I'm working to develop is something that exists in lots of other fields, including acupuncture, which is an extension to research reporting guidelines that is specific for our modality. So what it will say is, if you're writing about yoga research, here are the things you need to tell us in order to make that research useful. So things like, you know, we, we do need to know about dose. We need to, do, to know how long and how many times and over, you know, the duration, et cetera. But we also need to know about what the practices were. Did you meditate? If so, what kind of meditation was done? What portion of it was meditation? Did you do physical practices? What physical practices? How rigorous were they? Were they modified? How were they modified? Who made the decisions about the modification? Who was leading the intervention? How was the intervention designed? Where did it draw from? You know, all of those kinds of things, because when we have that information, then you can read a paper and say, oh, well, no wonder these things changed. Because look at the practices they were doing. That makes perfect sense. And you know what? These are some things that I could incorporate in my class with my students. That's how the research becomes translatable to daily life and decision making. Okay. Well, that sounds like it would be very valuable because I've read a lot of those kinds of studies where it's, oh, yes, and then we did yoga. Uh, Great. What did you? (laughs) I have no idea what that means. (laughs) Okay. So. So let's, I think we've covered the research to the extent that I want to right at the moment, but um, what I'd like to get into a little bit more is what you found out in your studies and probably still are about how yoga is beneficial for arthritis. Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, the study that we initially conducted at Johns Hopkins, which was a rigorous randomized control trial, <laughs> um, it was done the way that we hope that most yoga studies will be. And then it was replicated at NIH for underserved minorities with arthritis, including African Americans and Spanish speakers. And uh, we're now doing a study in three major hospitals in New York that looks at yoga in addition to acupuncture for people with chronic pain, including arthritis. So the, the work continues. And I'll tell you that what we have learned so far is, I mean, the short answer is people sometimes say, so does it work? <laughs> yeah, right. and, yeah. So the short answer is, yes, it works. And then the next question is, well, what are the outcomes? What, what is the result of practicing yoga for people with arthritis? I have to make the caveat, though, that when I'm saying that yoga works, quote unquote, for people with arthritis, I'm talking about the yoga that we did in our research studies, which may be different from the yoga that people encounter when they go to their local community center or YMCA, because 
the yoga is tailored to the needs and limitations of people living with arthritis. So when I talk about how yoga can benefit people with arthritis, it first assumes that the yoga is safe and appropriate for people with arthritis. And not all yoga is. Um, and that's a whole other conversation that we can have or say for another time. But when yoga is offered in a way that is safe and appropriate for people with arthritis, I would say probably what most people are interested to find out is that it decreases pain. And in fact, in our research, we found decreases in pain of 30%, which is comparable to medications. So a reduction in pain, but what I'm interested in is how yoga can transform lives. And certainly if your pain is reduced, then that can transform your life. But it is also possible that your life can be transformed regardless of whether or not your pain changes. And so it was important to me to explore things like quality of life and stress management and self-efficacy for managing disease and physical function and clinical markers. So in addition to what people probably care most about in this day and age, which is that pain decreased, it's also important to note that quality of life improved and a variety of domains within quality of life improved, aspects of mental health, mental and emotional health improved, and there is a very high comorbidity of depressive symptoms for people living with arthritis, partly because of the shared link of inflammation, that arthritis is inflammatory and depression is inflammatory, and partly because it's depressing to be in pain and have your movement limited and not be able to do the things that you're used to doing. So we saw improvements in depressive symptoms and other markers of mood, mental, and emotional health. And we also saw changes in the clinical assessment of the joints and the, the report from individuals about the health of their joints. In subsequent studies where we looked at both quantitative outcomes, but also qualitative outcomes where the data are the stories that people report, we found people talking about how yoga is a tool to be able to manage their disease and to sort of have something that they can use when prior they felt despondent that there was nothing that they could do for themselves to help manage their disease. Excellent. Now, you've also produced uh, a DVD, correct? The Arthritis Friendly Yoga. Yeah. So uh, one of the the funders of our research at Johns Hopkins, in addition to NIH, was the Arthritis Foundation. And the Arthritis Foundation funded us on both a national level and a state level in order to conduct and expand these studies and make them larger and more rigorous. And subsequent to that initial randomized controlled trial, the Arthritis Foundation asked me to create a DVD for them. And when we were designing it, I said, all right, I'm, I'm willing to do this, but there are certain must-haves that I need to be in there. And one of them was a tutorial for how to move through the sun salutation with variations. Another was a, a relaxation practice that people could use when they didn't feel up to a physical practice. Some frequently asked questions. It was important to me that the people that they used in the class actually have arthritis and that they be demonstrating a variety of ways to do the practice so that somebody who's practicing doesn't just hear my language saying you could use this version or that version, but actually sees someone who has arthritis in front of them choosing that option. So I, I think it's great. I know not a lot of people have access to DVD drives anymore, but <laughs> if, you, if you have a way to, to use it, I, I think that they did a, a nice job with it and it's beautifully produced, you know, okay. as the Arthritis Foundation can do. Great. So if you have, a, have access to a DVD reader or whatever they are called, <laughs> this sounds like an excellent resource because you can actually see what happens and, and be able to duplicate it if you, if you feel like it. And to expand even more, you've also recently written, have an almost published book. Is that correct? <laughs> so yeah. That, <laughs> so let's talk about that because that's the okay. next step, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll also mention, Stephanie, that for those who don't have a DVD player, 
on our website, we do have some online practices available. They're not as beautifully produced as the Arthritis Foundation with a, a whole bunch of you know lovely models doing different variations, <laughs> but they do offer some tools that yoga professionals may want to use with their students and clients or people living with arthritis might want to try on their own. Okay. And let me yes. just put in there that that's www.arthritis.yoga. Okay. Well, I'll do that again at the end, but just so people will know. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the book. <laughs> <laughs> the book, yes. <laughs> so it's coming out uh, in December. I'm not sure when in December. It's uh, being published by Singing Dragon Press, which has been absolutely wonderful to work with. And I mean, this has been a book that is many, many years in the making. And again, like the DVD, there were certain things that I felt were must-haves that when communicating with uh, Singing Dragon, I said, okay, I'll do this if. <laughs> and one was that it was very important to me that it be based in the Panchamaya Kosha model, which, by the way, aligns really beautifully with the biopsychosocial model or the biopsychosocial spiritual model, which is well accepted in modern science. And so we start in the book with the physical body, which I think is where most people's minds go when they're thinking about yoga for arthritis. They think about the physical joint tissue and they think about the physical yoga practices. And I want to convey with this book that arthritis is a disease or actually a set of diseases because it includes over 100 different conditions. Arthritis affects the whole person, including every aspect of that person. And yoga is a whole person practice that intervenes on every level of the person. So while the book starts with a physical understanding of the body and the joints and what's happening in the tissues, we move through the koshas to go from gross to subtle and talk about the role of arthritis and the role of yoga practices in the other koshas, including how it affects energy and how it affects the mind and the emotions and how it affects meaning and purpose, which you might translate to spirituality. So that was important to me. And we moved through that in the chapters of the book. It was also important to me to have personal stories because as I said earlier, conducting research, you know, it's often distilled into aggregated numbers where we talk about an average and a range around that average. And what we sometimes lose in those numbers are the personal stories that make the numbers meaningful, that explain why the numbers look the way that they do. And having been doing this research for so many years and working clinically as a yoga therapist and teacher with these populations, I have been blessed to witness stories of transformation, both gradual and sudden in the way that a person lives with arthritis. So it was really important to me to be able to share those stories, to go beyond the numbers and to help make the use of yoga for arthritis relatable in terms of the way that it really can change lives. And then I know that everybody's really interested in the modification. So of course, there's a whole section on lots of different practices and how they can be safely and appropriately modified for people with arthritis, as well as, you know, how to talk to healthcare providers and how healthcare providers can talk to their patients and where to find an appropriate class and ways to advocate for yourself in your own practice, how to develop a practice on your own, et cetera. So it really was written with three audiences in mind, yoga professionals, including yoga teachers and yoga therapists, people living with arthritis, and the healthcare professionals who serve them. So I hope that there is something for everyone in all of those audiences in this book. Yeah, that, that sounds extremely valuable because um, it kind of hits everybody that might be affected by this particular condition. Uh, do you feel comfortable sharing one of those stories with us? Oh my goodness, there are so many. Okay, yeah, I'll share one of my favorites. <laughs> so there was a woman who, so one thing that is important to know when listening to the story is we often think of arthritis as affecting older persons. And in fact, 
you can get arthritis at any age. And um, some of the people I've worked with have had arthritis since they were toddlers. Oh. And there are 300,000 children in the US with arthritis and obviously more around the world. So this particular story is about a woman who was diagnosed at age 16. And by the time she met me, she was in probably her early 20s. She had been a dancer and arthritis had really taken a toll on not only her ability to do the things that she loved, but also her self-concept. And this is something that I think is really important is the way that arthritis changes not only what we can do, but how we see ourselves and the roles that we play in the world, which take some adjusting to. And she had gone through a period of not taking care of herself and therefore her disease getting worse, non-adherent to medical recommendations and really feeling probably at her worst. She said, I think that she was 23 and she said that she felt like she was 83. And she saw an advertisement for a research study at Johns Hopkins where she had actually moved in order to be able to seek care there on a hope and a prayer that somebody at Johns Hopkins would be able to help her. So I think she saw something in U.S. News and World Report about Johns Hopkins being the best place for um, arthritis management in the country. So she, because she had a dance background, she took to the physical practice very well. She had an understanding of her body and its placement in space and was able to execute many of the postures with an ease that didn't come to some of her classmates. And she was in some gentle bridge pose. And I was cueing them to sort of, you know, gently lift their hips up off of the ground just a couple of inches and then lower back down, you know, rolling a little bit through the spine. And I could see her. And if you can imagine, she was in like the highest bridge possible. Uh, So she was way up in, you know, her whole back was arched. And I could see that she was like trying to figure out how to go even further. And so I asked her if she would like to try wheel. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have done this with someone else that didn't have her muscle memory and agility and all of that. But she hemmed and hawed for a moment and then said, no, thank you. And it was a couple of classes later and I could see her trying again. And this time she's got both of her hands on the floor on either side of her head. And she's uh-huh. And I walked over and I said, you know, would you like me to, to give you some assistance? And I barely provided any assistance whatsoever. I just had a hand underneath her hips and shoulders and she pressed up into a wheel. Now it turns out that the first place that she ever got arthritis was in her wrist and that she had that bridge pose or what became a wheel was absolutely transformational in her life because not only was she able to execute something that she never thought she would be able to do again, that she remembered from her days as a dancer and I think as a gymnast, but also that the weakest part of her body was holding her up and that she in that moment realized that she and her body could work together, that they could be on the same team. And All of a sudden, she went from an adversarial relationship with her body where she hated it Mm -hmm. and didn't treat it well to a partnership with her body and even subsequently her arthritis where they work together. And she would say today that she is grateful for her arthritis, for everything that it has taught her. And she then went on to start eating healthy food. She ran a couple of half marathons with the supervision of her doctor. She reduced her medication. She lost a bunch of weight. She had a couple of kids. She just is absolutely thriving. And I would say that it happened in that single moment of that wheel. And it's not about what the wheel did in her wrist joint. It's about what the wheel did for her notion of who she is in the world. That's great. Thank you so much. And that's just one. <laughs> that's just one. Yes. And that's even better. And it's just one. Right. Um, and if, and so let's segue into, you also have training so that teachers can learn from your expertise and from all of the research you've done on how to uh, perhaps bring something similar in their own students. <laughs> so uh, if someone wanted a little more information about this, what, what would you tell them about your training? 
Yeah, so um, the training happens in three levels. And I would say that the first level, I really wish that every yoga teacher on the planet could take because arthritis is so prevalent that no matter what classes you're teaching, somebody with arthritis is coming to your class. And because arthritis can strike at any age, you don't know who they are when they walk in. Uh, and I think it's important for all of us to have a sensitivity to that and not just arthritis, but lots of chronic pain conditions and inflammatory conditions that if we're sensitive to, we can just change slightly the way that we language something and the options that we offer and make a huge difference in whether someone feels welcome and accepted and understood, whether somebody gets hurt or doesn't get hurt that day, and whether they give up on yoga or stick with it for a lifetime. So that level one training does provide the protocol from our research study so that you can do that eight week 16 class series in your community right out of the research evidence that you can say this is associated with reductions in pain and improved physical function and improved mood and quality of life etc but also, I just hope that it changes the way that you teach because it changes your awareness in general. And then for those who are really interested in specializing in work with this population, whether it be in hospital settings or integrative health centers or senior centers or local practices, the level two has one-on-one -on -one mentoring to help look at your teaching and delivery and how you can personally grow. And then level that follows that really focuses on one-on-one -on -one and how to, how to inquire in advance and you know, do a proper intake, how to develop a treatment plan, how to communicate with healthcare providers and, and with your client and, and tailor the practice for them, use the research evidence, et cetera. So there's more information about that on the website. And in fact, so the, the training happens in cities around the U.S. every year. Um, no international trainings yet, but hopefully that will come at some point in the future. But we also are starting to offer hybrid and online programs. And so there's already some of that in the works. There are some places where it's a shorter period of time in person because there's some work that you've done up front online. And I teach at a university that has a really robust online learning system and they're developing a hybrid program that's incredibly interactive and really aligned with modern pedagogy for online learning. So those are other available options. Oh, great. Yes, because it, it is hard if if you have to be face to face, I'm not saying it's not the best way to teach because I think often it is. It's just sometimes hard to get to some of those. Well, also, places. you know, a lot of the people who are interested in teaching to the arthritis community have arthritis themselves. There are lots of yoga teachers and yoga therapists who are living with arthritis and they want to be able to offer this, but it's not always easy to get to a live training when you have a disability or pain or a movement limitation. So we want to make this as widely available and accessible as possible, understanding that also being in person is a very different learning experience. So we're trying to make it available in different ways to meet different needs. Great. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to um, give Stephanie's contact details, but is there anything that you would like to add that you feel we haven't either covered in enough depth or that you'd like to add to tell the listeners? So I'll just say that I'd like to offer an open invitation to all of your listeners that I want to be of service to the field and to the people we serve. And so if you have questions, if you uh, have a very specific question or a very general question, there's no such thing as a silly question. From now until the end of time, don't be hesitant to reach out to me and I will do my best to provide information or resources or assist you in whatever way possible. Thank you. Okay. For, so if you want to um, contact Stephanie, it her website is www.arthritis.yoga. Her Facebook is Yoga4, and that's the number four, arthritis. And the email, which you can get on the website, is info at arthritis.yoga. So thank you, Stephanie, for coming on. You've uh, given us some great tips uh, about research, which I appreciate, <laughs> as well as uh, some information about 
arthritis in general that I think is, is really important, especially about it being a whole body kind of thing. It's just not about the pain. So uh, I want to really thank you. It's been a great interview and so much. I really appreciate you willing to take the time to do it. Well, thank you so much for having me, Stephanie, and thank you for everything you do in, in bringing excellent information to the community. Thank you for that wonderful interview. If you would like to be a guest on Changing the Face of Yoga, please go to my website, www.yogalightness.com.au, and under the Changing the Face of Yoga tab, you can complete the Be Our Guest form. After reviewing the form and finding it applicable to this podcast, we will send you a link to schedule an interview. Please download, review, and tell your friends of any podcasts that are of interest to you and to them. If you would like to contact me, send an email to info at yogalightness.com.au. And thank you for listening to Changing the Face of Yoga.